Well, good morning, South Africa and everyone on the African continent. Welcome right here on the Morning Express as we give you all the latest news updates, all things happening in the continent of Africa and throughout the world. And I am Harmony Mbele. Mbele Kulu, unontandu tlambulu, langa loglu ngombi, tombi gazo, sompisi, onda visit. And it is a choosy Tuesday. What do you choose on this choosy Tuesday? Let us know on our social media platforms. And we are gun underscore TV underscore. And on Facebook, we are Galaxy Universal Network. Allow us to really get to converse and engage with you and really get us to tell us what are you choosing this 2021 and so it is really the beginning of the year what really do you want to anticipate within the news current affairs what are you anticipating within parliament what do you think our leaders will do differently this year and that is a question that we are posing to you this morning what do you choose this morning and what do you choose for our government and state of affairs and welcome right here to the morning express and take a look at our headlines and we give you all the latest COVID-19 statistics and also tributes a flood in for the late chef and award-winning author and also tributes uh, to iconic uh, Sitsuan musician also flooding in and pouring in on our timelines uh, this morning and also Mama Bulo pleased uh, with the COVID-19 compliance within everyone in South Africa and thousands of motorists screened and also tested in Gauteng knowing that it is the time where in Swan people are out in numbers uh, Metro Police are actually doing everything they can to make sure that uh, uh, all, all uh, 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 commuters rather actually following all COVID-19 uh, procedures also the taxi drivers themselves having sanitizers are they wearing masks is there some sort of um, uh, identification within uh, the, the procedures that need to be followed within the taxi industry but this morning we get right into it giving you all the latest news and updates and South Africa has now identified uh, uh, one over 1.1 million cases of the coronavirus and a total of uh, 911 recoveries uh, to date. And the latest stats also show that with over 6 million tests conducted, over 12,000 new cases have now been reported, uh, representing a 33.7 positive uh, rate within South Africa. And the latest uh, stats also reveal that COVID-19 fatalities surpassed the 30,000 mark with over uh, 434 four additional deaths, bringing the death toll to 30,111, many of which were reported in the Western Cape and Eastern Cape. Gauteng has remained the epicenter of the outbreak in South Africa, accounting for 27.1% of the overall cases, while the Western Cape is sitting at over 200 and 221,657 cases and Guazul Natal province with 19.5% of its cases and closely followed behind by that. And also now let us listen to an important message from the head of a, a clinical uh, department at uh, the Paragwanath uh, Hospital urging for people to take uh, precautions during the second surge of the COVID-19 outbreak. <laughs> This message is going out because we're facing the COVID pandemic. We are in the second surge and we are in a crisis mode. We need to take extra precautions. Our healthcare facilities are in trouble. Our healthcare workers are vulnerable. We need to protect them. We need to protect you, South Africans. And we need to work together to achieve this. So you can help the healthcare workers by staying home, by wearing masks, by socially distancing, by washing your hands, and only going out if it's essential to do so. And also moving on to quite a touching uh, story this morning. Tributes have continued flooding in for the late chef and award-winning author Dora Sitole. According to reports, uh, the former True Love magazine editor and stylist passed away at the, uh, at the hospital uh, in Johannesburg this past weekend at the age of 67. Oh, I'm in such a hurry and I'm just like, look at the bag, 
Look at him right. Oh. <laughs> oh, I feel so good. Okay. Oli, eh, eh, man. Don't steal my thunder, Oli. Yes. There is a tally. 40 years of iconic. And are still paying tributes to all, to all the people that have really passed away who were iconic in their own will and right. Sports, uh, Arts and Culture Minister Natim Teto paid tribute to iconic Sitswana contemporary musician Ndate Kori Muraba, who died on Sunday, on Sunday morning. And the musical legend had reportedly been admitted to hospital after showing COVID-19 symptoms. And also continue with our stories right here on the Morning Express. The Gauteng MEC for Road and Transport, Jacob Mamabulo, said on Monday that he was pleased with COVID-19 compliance in some parts of the province. And Mamabulo made these remarks at a joint interprovincial uh, uh, re reprimand uh, uh, statistics roadblock as part of the ongoing efforts of the provincial government to ensure that those in private and public transport adhere to safety regulations to contain the spread of the novel virus. And this comes as the province which remains the hardest hit continues to urge people to avoid the three C's namely crowded places closed uh, places and close contact uh, settings only right here in South Africa and making sure that also our tax industries are also put in place with making sure that regulations are being followed and, uh, we are participating in a law enforcement operation as part of the province wide uh, law enforcement activities that has been announced by the provincial government. And uh, in this particular operation, that started at 6 o'clock this morning, uh, which means it's still early um, uh, in terms of um, trends and patterns and what's going on. But uh, thus far, the key observations we have made are firstly that um, with respect to COVID-19 compliance, uh, both from public transport and um, private motorists or pr uh, owners of pr private vehicles, is that um, the message uh, seemed to have um, reached the people because uh, what we are seeing is uh, everybody who is passing through the roadblock is wearing a mask. That is a positive sign of compliance. And um, we are also seeing that um, uh, people are carrying their own sanitizers, public transport have sanitizers, and uh, people are confirming that uh, when the taxis um, leave uh, taxi rents, they do get sanitized. And uh, that there are also checks to confirm that uh, everybody is fully compliant. So with respect to COVID-19 compliance, uh, we are very much satisfied with the compliance level and we must commend the people. And still in Gauteng, and still taking, uh, still talking rather about COVID-19 compliance, Gauteng Mayor Jeff Makuba, alongside Gauteng Premier David Makura and other members of the provincial executive team embarked on a road safety campaign at the Khasmir uh, Toll Plaza. And the campaign which includes, uh, uh, the, uh, which includes the provincial uh, headed heads and also law enforcement officers was uh, to educate motorists on the importance of uh, uh, taking protective measures during the COVID-19 
COVID-19 outbreak and, bulking, uh, and buckling up and keeping up within the speed limits on the road. We are here at the Grassmead Plaza as a joint operation between province, uh, SAPS and JMPD and the Department of Health, both in Johannesburg and Alden. We are joined by the Premier, the MEC for Health and the MEC for Community Safety. We, it's a roadblock, it's a routine roadblock that uh, is screening people from other provinces and talking about COVID-19 as an operation to search cars to see whether uh, they are not stolen, there's no alcohol, they're not transporting illegal things and they're complying with the regulations. So far, so good. People are voluntarily testing. NHLS is here, uh, the province is here, and they're testing people for COVID. They've screened over a thousand people coming from the Western Cape, the Eastern Cape, uh, Free State. Uh, so, uh, so far, the operation is going well, and I think uh, the people coming into our province uh, uh, will be well looked after. An ANC councillor and chief whip of the city of Joburg, ANC, um, Kosa Soli Mukhasi, announced uh, the suspension of rape accused uh, PR councillor who had been uh, who had made a court appearance at the Alexandra Magistrates Court on Monday. And according to a statement by the Joburg uh, uh, courses, uh, the decision was made after the PR councillor accused of rape was released on 2,000 rand bail and also remanded in custody uh, to the 22nd of February following his brief appearance. At to the Weinberg Magistrates Court and also the PR councillor Kenneth Magaga was formally charged with rape alleged uh, committed on December the 26th and has committed and submitted rather an affidavit where he has vowed to plead not guilty to the charges and in making the decision uh, Mukhase said in a statement that he had consulted uh, and consulted and discussed the matter with the office barriers of the ANC adding that the councillor the councillor was also relieved of of his duties while still pending his case. And the councillor in question has uh, also uh, been revealed to have written and, uh, to the ANC and also causes uh, requesting that he be put on leave for pending the outcomes of his trial. And ANC supporters left the, the country divided after having come out in numbers to show their support for the councillor outside the court and also knowing that was the youth league supporting him from the uh, Alexandra uh, area and also knowing that they also spoke out on the matter very, uh, very saying that he is innocent and this is what they had to say. And also continuing with our news right here on the Morning Express, uh, Scotland's First Minister Nicola Scurgeon issued a directive, uh, a, a directive which will see people forced to stay at home aimed at the fresh lockdown in an, uh, in an attempt to arrest an increase in the new COVID-19 infections. And making this announcement so during a briefing on Monday, Scurgeon said that the new laws will be in, uh, introduced at midnight and will also see schools remain closed at public, uh, to, public uh, to pupils rather until next month and the new laws will also require people to stay at uh, to stay at home and also work from home or whatever else are possible so that they're also safe from the coronavirus and she also added that the new laws will apply across uh, the Scottish uh, mainland until the end of this month and will also be kept under review. I can confirm now in summary that we have decided to introduce from midnight tonight for the duration of January a legal requirement to stay at home except for essential purposes. This is similar to the lockdown of March last and also the Scotland's uh, first uh, uh, minister also continued and further elaborated on the matter. It is no exaggeration to say that I am more concerned about the situation we face now than I have been at any time since March last year. In the week from the 23rd to the 30th of December, the seven-day incidence of cases per 100,000 of the population increased by 65% uh, from 136 per 100,000 to 225 per 100,000. Test positivity has risen sharply too. The next update on the numbers of COVID patients in hospital and intensive care will be published tomorrow. I would expect these to show that nationally, the total number of COVID patients in hospital is now close to the April peak. And in some boards, the pressure is already very real. 
For example, in terms of hospital beds, NHS Ayrshire and Arran is currently at 96 per cent of its COVID capacity, and three other health boards, Borders, Greater Glasgow and Clyde and Lanarkshire, are above 60 per cent of their capacity. The number of people in intensive care is still significantly lower than the April peak, which of course partly reflects the fact that treatment of COVID has improved significantly since last spring. But even so, the total number of patients in intensive care in Scotland is already above normal winter levels. Indeed, all mainland health boards have now exceeded their normal intensive care unit capacity. And it is important to be clear, and, and this is a key point, that people who are in hospital and intensive care now are likely to have been infected 10 days to two weeks ago. That means that these numbers reflect what the level of new cases was around two weeks ago. And given that the number of cases has increased significantly since then, that means we can expect to see significantly increased pressure on the NHS over the course of... And following in the heels of Scotland, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, had announced a new national lockdown for England, which people are instructed to stay at home as they did during the first leg in March when there was a shutdown in, 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 in England. And also the Prime Minister revealed the action, and rather this action in an eight-minute TV address on Monday night after being told that COVID-19 cases are rising rapidly in every part of the country due to the new coronavirus variant. Since the pandemic began last year, the whole United Kingdom has been engaged in a great national effort to fight COVID. And there's no doubt that in fighting the old variant of the virus, our collective efforts were working and would have continued to work. But we now have a new variant of the virus, and it's been both frustrating and alarming to see the speed with which the new variant is spreading. Our scientists have confirmed this new variant is between 50 and 70 percent more transmissible. That means you're much, much more likely to catch the virus and to pass it on. As I speak to you tonight, our hospitals are under more pressure from COVID than at any time since the start of the pandemic. In England alone, the number of COVID patients in hospitals has increased by nearly a third in the last week to almost 27,000. And that number is 40% higher than the first peak in April. On the 29th of December, more than 80,000 people tested positive for COVID across the UK, a new record. The number of deaths is up by 20% over the last week and will sadly rise further. And my thoughts are with all those who've lost loved ones. With most of the country already under extreme measures, it's clear that we need to do more together to bring this new variant under control while our vaccines are rolled out. In England, we must therefore go into a national lockdown which is tough enough to contain this variant. The public are being asked to follow the new rules which leave, uh, which now really have replaced England's tie system immediately. And it is expected the new lockdown in England and it has been implemented for the third time the national shutdown has been introduced and it will also last until the middle of February. And because we now have to do everything we possibly can to stop the spread of the disease, primary schools, secondary schools and colleges across England must move to remote provision from tomorrow, except for vulnerable children and the children of key workers. Everyone will still be able to access earlier settings such as nurseries. We recognise that this will mean it's not possible or fair for all exams to go ahead this summer as normal. The Education Secretary will work with Ofqual to put in place alternative arrangements. We will provide extra support to ensure that pupils entitled to free school meals will continue to receive them while schools are closed and we will distribute more devices to support remote education. I completely understand the inconvenience and distress this late change will cause millions of parents and pupils up and down the country. Parents whose children were in school today may reasonably ask why we did not take this decision sooner. 
And the answer is simply that we have been doing everything in our power to keep schools open, because we know how important each day in education is to children's life chances. And I want to stress that the problem is not that schools are unsafe for children. Children are still very unlikely to be severely affected by even the new variant of COVID. The problem is that schools may nonetheless act as vectors for transmission, causing the virus to spread between households. Today, the United Kingdom's chief medical officers have advised in recent weeks, uh, the new highly transmittable variant of the virus has taken a hold in London and southeast England, prompting an, uh, an alarming spike in the cases number to a close to 60,000 a day and also putting hospitals under pressure to acute pressure on also those that are coming in reporting and, pos and, and testing positive for COVID-19. The country should move to alert level five, meaning that uh, if action is not taken, NHS capacity may be overwhelmed within 21 days. Of course, there is one huge difference compared to last year. We're now rolling out the biggest vaccination programme in our history. So far, we in the UK have vaccinated more people than in the rest of Europe combined. With the arrival today of the UK's own Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, the pace of vaccination is accelerating. I can share with you tonight the NHS's realistic expectations for the vaccination program in the coming weeks. By the middle of February, if things go well and with a fair wind in our sails, we expect to have offered the first vaccine dose to everyone in the four top priority groups identified by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. That means vaccinating all residents in a care home for older adults and their carers, everyone over the age of 70, all frontline health and social care workers, and everyone who is clinically extremely vulnerable. If we succeed in vaccinating all those groups, we will have remo removed huge numbers of people from the path of the virus. And of course, that will eventually enable us to lift many of the restrictions we have endured for so long. The country should move to alert level five, meaning that uh, if action is not taken, NHS capacity may be overwhelmed within 21 days. Of course, there is one huge difference compared to last year. We're now rolling out the biggest vaccination program in our history. So far, we in the UK have vaccinated more people than in the rest of Europe combined. With the arrival today of the UK's own Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, the pace of vaccination is accelerating. I can share with you tonight the NHS's realistic expectations for the vaccination programme in the coming weeks. By the middle of February, if things go well, and with a fair wind in our sails, we expect to have offered the first vaccine dose to everyone in the four top priority groups identified by the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. That means vaccinating all residents in a care home for older adults and their carers, everyone over the age of 70, all frontline health and social care workers, Thank you very much, South Africa, for joining us right here on the Morning Express. We pride ourselves on bringing all the latest news, updates, all things happening in South Africa and throughout the world. And at this point, allow us to take a quick breather. We'll be back with more news and that special feature of the day. Joining me, not one, but two gentlemen who will be breaking all things to do with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic that has broken out in South Africa.
make massive moves. So from the theater stage to the kitchen. I'm anxiously awaiting to see Sanaya. What else is this if not love? Make massive moves with Starside. Make massive moves. Continental America's champion. That was delightful. Make massive moves with Stars Head. Make massive moves. Picture perfect, you don't need no filter. Another one. Make messy moves with Stars Head. And welcome back from the ad break. Thank you very much for joining us right here on the Morning Express as we pride ourselves once again on bringing you all the latest news, updates, all things happening in South Africa and throughout the world. And today right here on the show, we really get to unpack and really get to dissect all things happening within the coronavirus pandemic that has hit us since last year in the midst of March when the lockdown was introduced in South Africa. And today I really get to be joined by two doctors that are going to be helping us really unpack and really get to have quite a, a, a microscope into what is happening. And today in studio, I get to be joined by Dr. Benvolio Machela and also Dr. Tony Nock. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Respectively, uh, Dr. You. Benvolio, I think I should start with you. I should start with you. Um, what happened on the 21 days of the pandemic when it started? What was your reaction as a doctor? What did you understand of it when it started? I immediately get to appreciate that uh, the second wave is here and seems like we are going back to the initiation of the pandemic mm. when it hit South Africa 20, uh, 20 March. Yes, yeah. absolutely. But and then when, when the president at that time really said we are shutting down, there is a pandemic, and you guys being doctors, what is your first um, take on that? I mean, it was obviously to actually mm. make sure that um, hospitals are able to take in the patients, uh, all those are, that are going to be testing positive. But I was really putting measures in place. How did that affect you as doctors in that 21 days? Did you anticipate what is happening today? Look, uh, how many? Uh, I don't think we anticipated. And I think what was important uh, for me, if I can just uh, remember back, is that, you know, there was a, a pandemic, a first of its kind, you yes. know, that, that, you know, we had to go to the extremes of lockdown, et cetera. And Absolutely. But, but as well is that, you know, hospitals and health systems are actually not designed uh, for us to just easily be able to deal with such a condition. And that, that was a challenging part to say, uh, you know, do we have enough time to actually re-strategize? Mm. Uh, do we have in, in, enough time to be able to put measures in place that are going to be able to actually make it worthwhile for us to be able to combat the, the, the pandemic? Mm. Well, were those measures put in place? I think now, I think at, at some point, even I asking these questions have to play the devil's advocate, mm -hmm. really asking professions themselves that are in there, really taking the patients on a daily basis, testing them on a daily. How has it been for you within the healthcare profession, starting with you, doctor? On my side, I got to experience the harsh side of the pandemic, mm. uh, given the fact that uh, our healthcare system is already struggling. Mm. So now it's just worsening the whole situation because, I mean, we are understaffed. We're sitting at the ratio of 
of at least one doctor is to 40, sorry, to 90 patients, when ideally we should be sitting on around one is to 40. Mm. So we are already overstretched. Yes. And then meaning uh, we are more at risk of exhaustion as uh, professional ourselves. Yeah. And I don't think we actually had enough support from the government in all in all, given mm. that uh, there was not an increase uh, in the number of staffing. Mm. The resources were not, in, uh, were not um, adequate. So it hit us quite bad. Oh, wow. And I think now really bring in the ratio perspective of it. And also we're going to touch on the government later on. But looking at the 1 to 90 per patient, I mean, one doctor or nurse at that point taking care of 90 patients single-handedly, how then does that give us the backlog of the results coming out, the backlog of really getting to be tested, really understanding themselves as a human being also because our nurses and doctors are fathers, mothers, aunts, mm -hmm. uh, uncles. Mm -hmm. But how then, uh, what is the stress toll on a doctor? Sure, how many? That, that is, yeah. You can imagine. Yeah. So, so it's a huge burden. I mean, uh, one thing is the ratio of one to ninety. Yes. Secondly, is the time you spend with one patient. Mm. So, so at the end of the day, uh, that that ninety actually it expands to a bigger number yeah. when you look at it in terms of the time that we have to spend with the patient. And secondly, you know, for the obvious reasons that uh, the testing of uh, um, of the SARS CoV two actually takes quite a, a bit of time. Absolutely. You know, uh, because we don't have enough resources as a country in terms of uh, the number of laboratories. And uh, even though there are some other laboratories, you find that uh, they're actually not accredited mm -hmm. to be able to deal uh, with, with, with 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 such measures. So, so then it you know it, it becomes tiring for for the medical practitioners, the clinicians, uh, the nurses, uh, because of uh, you yourself, you know, sometimes you, you, you feel that you might not yeah. be well, but you understand what role you're actually playing, you know, in terms of numbers for the people that are actually, you know, fighting on the ground uh, as a first liner. So so it's, it's, it's really, it's a lot of strain. Yeah. I mean, also just speaking on strain, does this go back to the oath that you took as a doctor, Dr. Benvelo, when you said that this is what I'm undertaking, this is my life, this is what I am really um, saying this is my passion this is what the Lord has brought me to this world to do and this is taking care of the people that are sick and even when in times as dr. Tony is mentioning that um, you, you you do get sick you do get That's you true. do feel that I'm not well but I wake up every single day in the morning even when I might just be having symptoms of COVID-19 but you go there just so that you are helping those in the forefront how does then that not represent the salary intake during the pandemic itself was there supposed to be an increase from government perspective I mean we are also seeing uh, a, a big um, uh, uh, money coming in uh, to actually relieve South Africans and obviously people that are unemployed, people that are might be affected by um, COVID-19, but you yourselves as doctors have been mostly affected by it. Don't you think at that point a salary increase was something that the government should have taken note of or the uh, within the, the profession itself? I think that uh, should have been one of the measures that put in place. Yes. I mean, I do understand that, well, we did take the oath. We do have an income but given mm -hmm. the stress that we are going through at the moment, there should be an element of remuneration mm. for the kind of stress that we are taking. Because now it looks like we are not being appreciated yes. for the kind of work that we do. And on the other side, we get to put our lives literally on mm. the line. Because, I mean, now we got into a situation whereby, because um, I've been in private for some time, mm. then you get, you get to taste the real life threat mm. that you have to put in. Um, put your life um, um, at, because... Uh, uh, you're in a situation where by now there's the private hospital are full yes and now you know that if I get it because I get to deal with it every day then I'm just going to be another a statistic victim. exactly, exactly. Yeah. I think that is the hard fact that we are dealing yeah. with as South Africans yeah. but I mean both of you guys having your own private practices we're going to touch on that too how then you've been affected as a person that was solely depending on that as much as you do go to uh, your public hospitals to do uh, uh, work your hours at that time but let us take a look at the vaccine I think it's one aspect of it that we can speak of the coronavirus but that's one aspect we should always touch on the rollout implementation of it yeah. is it possible to have 67 percent of the vaccine rolled out by the end of the year in 2021 looking at the numbers at this point Look, I mean, how many? There's going to be various factors that are going to play. Uh, one is going to be the issue of the suppliers. How yeah. many suppliers can can you know South Africa get? Uh, there's run about maybe a postulation of about six suppliers, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they'll all be on board and mm. they'll actually all have you know the necessary a number of products to be able to help the country. Uh, the other issue is the issue of finance, obviously, and also the staff capacity that are going to be able to carry out uh, you know uh, giving those necessary people the viruses. So the the minister has come up 
up with a plan, uh, you know, to roll out in terms of phases, mm. uh, which obviously the first phase then, you know, is touching on the healthcare workers, uh, the frontliners themselves. Absolutely. And I think that uh, that is the important one. Once, once, once everybody, you know, in the front line is has gotten the first of all is comfortable to take it, has taken it, mm. you know, then we've got you know enough manpower to say that now let's go for the for the for the, for the, for the bigger fish where mm. you know we have a chance of actually getting to that 67 percent before the end of the year. I mean that is quite a big number to look at. Even looking at the stats, numbers, everything that has been projected. I mean we are looking at over a hundred thousand people per day that would need to get vaccinated if we start implementing by the end of February, beginning of February, end of February. But I mean looking at the first um, quarter of the year as projected by the health minister, Dr. Zulim Kiza, it's likely looking a bit rough in terms of those projections already. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, is herd immunity a way to go in South Africa? I think at this point in time, uh, with regard to the whole pandemic, mm. we should literally go for it. Given the statistics, now we are sitting at 1.1 million infections. Yes. The death toll is sitting at uh, 30,000. Mm. That, that's that's way too bad. Yeah. And now the numbers are literally going to skyrocket. And uh, given the fact that we already have a new yeah. strain coming in. But another note is that uh, we have to consider the whole reality around the vaccine. Absolutely. Because South African are a bit skeptical about it. And I mean, with over 30,000 uh, people already succumbing uh, to the death toll already, that's a big number to look yeah, at. Number. And yeah. who should be the first one to receive this vaccine? I mean, we are seeing uh, the death toll rising. We are seeing uh, the positive cases also in an influx in South yeah, Africa. Yeah. But who should be the first one? Should we see our president himself with his kids, wives, healthcare workers also being in the forefront taking the vaccine? It's a tricky one. one because how does one, one answer it? Is, is it by the book or, or, you know, do we try to use common sense about it? Mm. You know, I think that, yes, the people that develop it, you know, it only makes sense for, for them to take the lead. You know, if you believe in something uh, and if you're a leader, you should be able to, you know, uh, carry your sword and say, you know what, I can be the first one to take this. Mm. You know, but uh, according to the rollout of South Africa, you know, after the frontline uh, health, um, the frontline workers, yes. what we're going to have is the essential workers now those are your policing staff mm. and you know all the essential workers that have been working during the lockdown level yeah. five if you can remember so those are the ones that are going to be next in line you know so it, it, it's a tricky one yeah, it's, it's a tricky one. And, I and i think th th there's one other aspect that we actually need to uh, be aware of mm. especially uh, with the target you're talking about in terms of the 67 percent is that healthcare in south africa does not stop we still got like our ordinary casualties we yes. still got our ordinary maternity you know so so how are we going to reach that in terms of still con you know uh, maintaining continuity in our hospitals mm. is also going to be another challenge that I think that when we strategize as South Africa we need to be able to look into that as well and I think continuity is a big one but also asking the same doctor uh, asking you the same question doctor is that I mean looking at the rollout of the vaccine would you step in line and say that I'm taking the vaccine just to show South Africans that it is working even though we don't know the credibility of it because I mean doctor this side is actually giving us quite a skeptical answer saying that you know if we are willing to step up a front and do what needs to be done but what is your take on it who should be the first person in your line of work who should be in the forefront taking the vaccine uh, my take is that um our leaders should go first mm. they should go first and then uh, prove to us that this is the reality mm. it's working and they have to el eliminate the whole conspiracy around it absolutely now we get to appreciate the element is this really a pandemic is this a political issue yeah so we li literally uh for my side i and be skeptical on it and then uh, I, I will appreciate if the conspiracies get to be deleted mm. and then make it as real as possible. Study, I mean also stating on the conspiracies that are out there on, on the vaccines, looking at the doctors that are receiving uh, 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 the, the vaccine. We also saw on social media uh, a, a nurse that took it and already just fainted and we don't know if that was accurate but it's all also flooding on social media also knowing that uh, our, our do doctors Olim in South Africa saying that a lot of information will be withheld at this point in terms of the rollout how then do we uh, do, do we uh, progressively uh, enough with the vaccine but how then do we kill the misconceptions out there about the vaccine to South Africans to people that are ready uh, to take uh, the, the vaccine 
so how do we kill the misconception mm -hmm. it's it, it's going to be difficult like you know like i said the last time i was in studio that in, in a world of social media this yeah. becomes quite challenging because everybody's opinion uh, you know has got a right to an opinion yes and um everybody believes the opinion is valid but secondly it's going to be that you know once you've got people in affluent or rather in you know in, in positions of power in the country mm. and who have different views on this uh, whole topic that's what's going to make it very challenging because of a lot of these people are being followed by people so i think when we're going to tackle the misconception then we're going to need you know sort of uniformity amongst them mm. to be able to do that you know otherwise uh, as individual south africans that's going to be very difficult mm. to that is a big one that is absolutely a big one but uh, let us take a look at the manufacturers i mean there are a couple of them your Pfizer's came out uh biden take also came out uh, johnson, johnson and johnson is also Sipler. modern is actually one of them also yes. saying that we are out there trying to get the vaccine out how then do we get it out there who do we trust who don't we trust is it a matter of really finding black and white paper trail that proves that this one works and who are those people that are going to be used as demos that's going to be a difficult concept to crack mm. given the reality of the whole mystery like uh, dr nogas already um, eluded yes so um there should be rather hardcore clear evidence and if it's something that is going to be uh, put in human beings it should be a worldwide issue yeah because i mean now some of the vaccine i say um, are written not for use in the u.s canada america but for africa mm. so now it looks like africans are going to be used at, at less leverage in this case and now it's not something that uh, we will take quite well um, i've seen one note from the president of tanzania saying that um, if china did manage in less than six months to get down with the pandemic why do we really need a vaccine when they didn't need one mm. so there should be intensive hardcore research on this mm, absolutely i mean looking at china they were the first people that broke out with the uh with the pandemic and yet alone how they've actually been able to control it do you think that it was uh, the lockdown uh, uh, restrictions that they put in the country and how then do we call be something that works for them would it work for south africa well it was not just a matter of lockdown uh, china's resources are, are more you know advanced, advanced than south africa you know you remember that they built a, a hospital in a few days mm -hmm. which is uh, something that you know we st we're still uh, very far from so mm -hmm. yeah so so the, the, those the, the issue of resources then you know mm -hmm. it, it plays a huge role when, when it comes to healthcare. but of course uh, also systems uh, countries like cuba have little resources but have got a powerful system yeah. so then system also plays a role in in that regard whereby you know south africa is still trailing on the curative system yes or you know so so those are some of the various factors that uh, one still has to put at the tip of their mind when when looking at this issue absolutely and I think that is a big one but now let us bring it back to home mm -hmm. I think with you dr. Benvelo uh, uh, is that you actually have your own private practice you do your, your own COVID-19 um, tests or uh, once in a while and you're also also working within the, the public sector how's then have you seen the outbreak in South Africa within the line of work that you do I'm recently Recently, with the new strain, mm. what I've got to appreciate that most people come literally with quite severe symptoms mm. as compared to the previous strain. And uh, in my practice, I hardly get to see. Uh, people presenting with quite severe symptoms where okay. the disease have advanced. So in terms of testing is very limited. Most of the candidates I get to see in, in government, because yeah. maybe it's because of the financial implications of uh, you know seeking health care. So recently um, I could appreciate that uh, the second wave is quite severe, because yeah. now there was evidence that a death toll went up by 14,000. That was the first case. Uh, scenario mm -hmm. in our pandemic so it's been something that uh, it's been bad mm -hmm. absolutely and also touching on the new variant what is it how different is it from the first outbreak of COVID-19 to what it is now mm -hmm. how now how then do we specify those uh, differences Look, uh, the, fundament, uh, the fundamental difference is, is that with the new variant, actually what is happening is that it's got a higher sort of viral load. So yes. you got, you, you, so with with every cough or sneeze, you actually have a, a higher viral load than normal that what we are used to. But the second is also the, t the trans, uh, transmissibility. So, uh, you know, it's it's got a higher transmi transmissibility than mm. uh, uh, the, the norm that we are actually used to. So meaning that it's more lethal and it's more contagious. So uh, then it's definitely something that's going to really 
we need to, to, to fight and combat uh, as soon as possible. Hmm. And that is actually a big one. And I think I mean, it's also South Africa is really not understanding what is the difference. Yeah. How then do we deal with it? Does this mean now we wear masks more than frequently? Um, is it a matter of double? Like you see the, all the cloth masks that we see these days. Yeah. Very stylish. You put them over your nose. Do we then now have to wear double masks because it's that transmittable? I mean, people are using taxis. They're in public transport yeah. most of the time. How then do we make sure that even in that sector, even in that space, yeah. I mean, in a taxi for for Mastal San, it's very close by. You are giving someone they change. You are, you are obviously going to exactly. go communicate. How then do we break that? Then do we introduce new regulations within the taxi industry? Then how do we yeah. uh, break that chain to also help the healthcare workers? So um, I think uh, people just have to appreciate that uh, the pandemic is not gone. Though it's a new strain, it simply means that now we are even more at risk because we are not getting where we want to. It's not like we, it's like we are not winning in terms of the pandemic. Mm. And uh, given the fact that it's a new strain, mm. I mean, virus do actually mutate all the time. So with the current strain, now it's cornering us in a situation whereby things are getting even difficult. Because mm. we get to ask ourselves questions like, if it's a new strain, what about um, the vaccine that has been rolled out? Mm. Does it mean that we are going to be protected from it? What about the fact of getting more severe form of illness? So now um, it's just a matter of emphasizing on the protective measures that we have to take as being initiated previously. Absolutely. And I think taking a look at one of our provinces, the Eastern Cape, I mean, they are also uh, reported to be running out of coffins already because of the death toll that they have that side. How, uh, uh, how do we make sense of this? How do we make sense of such a pandemic really um, and taking so many lives and also leaving the Eastern Cape in such uh, a horrific manner? They're running out of coffins. The hospitals are also flooded. Healthcare workers are also strained. What do you say to them as doctors? Sure. It's, it's, it's really sad. Yeah. Because um, I think if you look at the mining industry in Limpopo, for example, uh, over 18,000 of the workers are actually from the Eastern Cape. Yeah. So, uh, you know, looking at the measures uh, already that they've been put in place for it, for the Eastern Cape, you know, so the economy is affected. Yeah. As you say, now the, 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 the you know, the, the way of life in terms of mm. uh, coffins, I mean, you, you, you're on a waiting list for a coffin. Uh, that's, that it's, it's something in our lifetime that Absolutely. is uh, obviously, yeah. uh, you know, uh, devastating and shocking. You know, so, so for, for, for the doctors, of course, it, it puts another strain on, on top of that because mm. this does not necessarily mean that the Eastern Cape is also going to to be first on the rollout for, for for vaccines. So they, the, you know, in terms of uh, the, the severity of the problem, they might be at a worse state. But in terms of uh, finding the solution, they're just going to be on the same level, unfortunately, as the rest of the country because of these already phases that have been put in place in order to combat that. Mm. And that is a big one, absolutely a big one. But I think now that we are all understanding COVID-19, we are understanding the pandemic yeah. that we're living in. How have you, doctors, really have succumbed to the new normal? How are you living? What is your daily life routine looking like? It's quite difficult in a sense that even though you get to see patients on a daily basis, you can't get used to the fact that I get to see a patient in the next hour I'm being called for a resource. Mm. Then when I get there, the patient is gone. Um, it's, it's, even though it's something that we get to be a bit immune to, but you can't get used to the fact that yeah. patients are dying mm. every day on your hands. And now knowing the reality that mm. you might be the next case is quite scary. It's mm. quite scary knowing that you might even contract the virus and you might even be the part of the statistics yeah. so that's quite scary oh, I'm I, yeah yeah I, I think what I found uh, fascinating about adapting to the new normal in the private uh, practice is that for the first time I think in in history patients come to consult knowing exactly what is wrong with them <laughs> and so it's, it, it's, it's, you know yeah yeah I mean they, you, they, 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 they actually tell you yeah. you know that about this and this and therefore blah 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 therefore I need such a through. test yes. therefore I will need so <laughs> you actually more of a listener and I think it's it, it, it's about time as well mm. that you know um, uh, health systems uh, across the globe uh, we, we, we appreciate the fact that uh, we need people to take responsibility you know for their own health yeah. and put education at the center of it because if that is happening it means that people are people are reading people are mm -hmm. alert and we need that we need that for for a change and not only with COVID but moving forward with other uh, medical conditions that is well. a big one also so looking at the 31st of December the 1st of December Paraguay actually not reporting any trauma cases how the relief from doctors I mean also hearing that from your brother and sister hospitals really saying that yo we did not really um, yeah, have yeah. any trauma cases being reported 
That's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, having Byron not have a case overnight. The biggest hospital. Exactly. <laughs> so now, um, it's just being obvious that uh, the company is going to be the factor was alcohol. Yes. And which is something that obviously is going to hit us at all fronts, given mm. the economy around yeah. it. Now is the pandemic. Yeah. So yeah. I would say, to some extent, we get a bit of relief. We get to mm. appreciate a bit of life from our side. Absolutely. And uh, we're literally going to need South Africans to support us by behaving, actually. Mm support us by actually adhering to the regulation, support us by wearing the mask, sanitizing, yeah. isolating all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. And the biggest question now, I think, before I let you gentlemen go, um, uh, what, in, what can the system the health care system do, the health ministry do to actually understand that they are not only looking at COVID-19, dropping the ball with any other diseases and only focusing on COVID-19, most especially the, uh, 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 the deadly diseases that we have in South Africa. How then do we make sure that we are focusing on the deadly diseases and also COVID-19? You know, uh, uh, healthcare is is very it's holistic. Yeah. You know, we, we like 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 we previously say that we cannot look at it as a one entity. So yeah. uh, I think what's really going to be at the center is education. Mm. It's uh, th that's the only way we're going to conscientize our people, but also conscientize ourselves is mm. that education, education, education. Uh, let people be aware that they such and such, and they need to be controlled. And as you remember, with, uh, with last year with the first variant, uh, whereby comorbidities was playing a huge role. Yes. People needed to constantly check their BPs, constantly check their cholesterol levels or their sugars. So it's it, it's very important that people. People are educated and, as I say, take responsibility yes. for their own health and not wait for a doctor or a clinician to say that, look, this is what's wrong with you. Let us take our own. Let's take ownership of our health care. Mm. And I think at this point I'm going to be asking even you, doctor, the same question. And I'm actually saying that answers are going to be the same at this point. Definitely. Just to expand <laughs> on what he has just uh, alluded. Um, with the reality of our health care system, we are doing more like damage control in a way. Mm. So patients come to hospital when they're sick in terms of not owning to your own or to their own health in in totality so um with the pandemic it mm. brought an element of ignorance from other illnesses i mean any respiratory problems now is covered until proven otherwise what about uh, tb what mm. about other issues what about the pneumonias yeah. so i just feel like we are ignoring other issues and patients yeah. are not literally taking um a good uh they're not receiving a good mm. uh a holistic uh, care from the whole uh, health uh, seeking behavior mm. if one can put it that way Absolutely. You, you know just to add to to, to what he's saying, I just, it's just something came into my mind <laughs> as he's speaking. Uh, so I had a situation whereby, uh, in my private practice, um, there was a queue of patients, mm -hmm. and then there was a patient that walked in having an asthma attack. So because of that whole, you know, difficulty in breathing, mm -hmm. everybody flocked out of the practice <laughs> and went home. <laughs> what? <laughs> so COVID. <laughs> it was COVID. Everybody went home and went to the next doctor. So you lost money that day. <laughs> I mean, you lost quite, I mean, that consultation fee really <laughs> chopped you off. But also, <laughs> but also looking at uh, the European country yeah. compared to uh, the African continent, really the, the different death tolls that we've seen, Africa also uh, recording a fewer death tolls than compared to um, Sc uh, Scottish, European countries, uh, your Londons, England. How then, uh, how then did we actually fight the epicenter of COVID-19 in the right way? I think it has to do with just being African. Yeah. Our gen genetic makeup actually did a good deal for us um, in terms of us being who we are. Mm. Um, as compared to the European countries whereby most of them succumb to the uh, virus regardless of the resources that they had in hand. Mm. So it was merely an element of yeah. genetics. Oh, wow. B yeah. uh, but uh, contrary to, uh, to, to what he's saying also, <laughs> you know, it's... Uh, look, I mean, if, if you're not testing your people as well, yeah. then uh, how do you know they've got COVID? True, That's another true. thing. Yeah. Uh, because of, I think a lot of other African countries don't have enough tests. That's so really you do have people dying, mm. but uh, they just don't know that they died from COVID. I think that's another aspect that we, oh, yes. we, we should actually also conscientize ourselves of, whereby the European countries, for example, a uh, majority of their populations are also tested. But it doesn't take away what he is, what is said. It's very important yes. as well. You know, the genetic makeup as well of Africans and, you know, the Caucasians is quite different. Absolutely. Well, in closing, uh, I heard you guys mention your private practices, where you guys, are, uh, doctors are based. So give us all those details. Where are you based? Where are you, where are you
you are. I mean, one might be from Limpopo, the other from Gauteng. <laughs> so give us all those details. Well, I'm based in uh, Pretoria West, and then in um, Lotus Gardens, uh, Kavan Beki 207, double seven uh, street. So it's uh, Benvolio Medical Suite. Then uh, we operating from 7 a.m. till 19 hours. Oh, 19 hours. That's a big now. So I'm based in uh, Buckley Square, Pretoria. As you enter passing Unisa on your right, you'll mm -hmm. see Buckley Square. Oh, that that's is you. You are right <laughs> there. Well, thank you very much, doctors, for joining me for this, uh, I think, uh, 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 powerful conversation yeah. due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you very much once again for joining me. It's thank a you pleasure. so much. It's a pleasure. Well, yeah. South Africa, this is it from myself. The Morning Express team really giving you guys all the latest information in terms of what is happening within the COVID-19 pandemic and how then do we address it? How then do we make sure that we're actually fighting everything that is happening within South Africa, also knowing that the second variant is actually broken out. I was joined by two doctors that really broke it down precisely to the T. For more information, uh, head over to all uh, uh, COVID-19 websites to really find out more information. But for myself and the team, it's goodbye. God bless. Make sure that you keep social distancing, wear your mask and sanitize. <laughs>